Welcome to the Geopolitical Week in Review with Daniel McAdams. You know, we like to review the mainstream headlines on this little discussion that Daniel and I have every week. Uh, we like to review those headlines as they relate to geopolitical events and then examine the truth behind the implications of those headlines uh, and the propaganda that is geared to keep us thinking in the way that the ruling elite would like us to think. And I frankly don't know of anyone better than Daniel McAdams of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity to focus on the details that are rarely, if ever, discussed in the mainstream to help us discern the truth behind the implications of the headlines that we are bombarded with day in and day out here uh, as Americans. So I want to thank you, Daniel, for joining me once again. Thank you, Jay. It's great to be with you again. Always good to hear what you have to say and always good to go to the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity website where there's a host of articles. Daniel and I talk about some of them that, uh, that he's more closely related to, that he has uh, perhaps penned himself, or the articles that Ron Paul has written uh, as well sometimes. But uh, Daniel, I'd like to just talk to you about uh, Nicholas Burns. He's the former U.S. ambassador to NATO. I heard him this past week on Bloomberg Television here in New York when I uh, got up one morning. He was there talking about the Ukraine. And he said, well, let's not forget what caused this crisis in the Ukraine. He said... The Ukrainian people really wanted to have a closer relationship with the West. They wanted to have a closer commercial and cultural relationship with the West. But this guy, this big bad Putin guy, didn't like that. He wanted to hang on to the Ukraine for his own selfish purposes. So it was really Putin that started the uh, the fighting and the uh, and the unrest in the Ukraine. So let's not forget what this what really caused this problem. Would you care to comment on that perspective? Well, to a degree, he's correct. You know, there were certain there was certainly a large faction of people in Ukraine, mostly in Western Ukraine, who wanted to, the, who wanted Ukraine to join the EU. They wanted to to look westward. Uh, but the the issue was that the president, who was democratically elected and thus a representative of the people, uh, decided at the last minute to sign a deal with Russia, which which he found more attractive. And uh, that's the beginning of the uh, of the unrest in this in this particular this particular round, I guess you'd call it, mm-hmm. because you already had an orange revolution there, you know, a decade ago. So here's here's the next round of it. Mm-hmm. To a to a degree, there's some truth to it, mm-hmm. but as with as with all propaganda, there's always a good dose of truth in in a in a big lie. And the fact of the matter is. The, the events that are now continuing to unfold in Ukraine, as, as, we, as we all should know, uh, were precipitated by U.S. involvement in the overthrow of the government, supporting the, the opposition, financing the opposition, giving money to opposition newspapers, uh, even to the point where U.S. officials were down in the midst of the protests encouraging the people to continue on their on their uh, quest to overthrow the government. Mm-hmm. So, so this is this is an absolute fact. But I think Jay, this is a great example of is the ambassador purposely lying, mm-hmm. or or is he misinformed? I guess mm-hmm. that's possible. Mm-hmm. Or, or, and I think this is really a part of it. Are, are there are there the foreign policy class in the United States so deluded by continuously existing in a closed loop? where they continue to read their own propaganda and believe it, that the, the mere suggestion that there's an alternative reality that's the reality mm-hmm. strikes them as bizarre, and I think that's the case. And I also think, Jay, that's very dangerous when you mm-hmm. have people in positions of power and influence who, who believe the propaganda that they're trying to sell the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And, and he's by no means alone. If you look at the current U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, uh, either him or whoever does his twittering uh, is active, you know, twenty four seven, retweeting and writing about about these things in such a way. Uh, you know, he's the guy, as you remember, in the famous recording, was participating with the State Department Assistant Secretary of State, uh, just openly discussing the overthrow of the Ukrainian government and how they're mm-hmm. going to do it and who they're going to select to to replace the president once he's overthrown. Now, these are all illegal activities. Yeah. You know, let's not forget that. So here's yeah. a person openly participating in it, and he's, he's still in office. There yeah. was no punishment for it because he was carrying out his, his orders. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, they got it, they got it backward. Yeah. They got it backward, and, they're, and, they're, and they continue to lie about it. 
And, of course, this is the perceived reality on the part of the American people because all the mainstream press is really is really presenting it this way, as if Putin was the bully uh, and that we were the good guys. And, you know, the, the fact is there's probably blame on both sides. But, you know, Daniel, I remember you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, getting back to this issue of uh, the elected Ukrainian president siding with Russia instead of NATO uh, or the West. And, and as I recall, you know, you laid out, I don't re- recall exactly what the details were, but you laid out the details of what the IMF and the West was offering uh, the Ukraine as opposed to what Putin was offering the Ukraine. And clearly, if I'm, you know, looking after the interest of the Ukrainian people, Putin provided a much better deal for the Ukrainian people than the West was providing at that time at least according to the numbers. I don't remember the numbers per se, but I remember it, it seemed to be stacked in favor. Uh, Putin's offer was much better for the Ukrainian people uh, as a whole than what the West's offer was. Well, it was also the difference between a loan and a, and a, and a grant and open aid. And the, US, uh, the, the Russians offered, and I, I forget the exact number as well, but a certain, a certain billions of dollars in, in straight aid to help Ukraine out of the absolute mess that it's in financially, mm-hmm. and the and the U.S. through the IMF offered a package of lo- of small, of relatively smaller loans, mm-hmm. and so at the, at the last minute he took the he took the aid. I mean, as as we would probably take free money over loans mm-hmm. <laughs> as mm-hmm. well. So that that was that was indeed the case, and you're seeing the kind of piecemeal uh, bailout that the IMF has has uh, laid out for Ukraine. You're seeing it play out right now. The Ukrainian economy is in absolute shambles. Uh, it, it, you know, this plan that the IMF has is a very is a very top down plan. It increases taxes on people. It makes it harder for people to do business. It prescribes uh, severe austerity, and really, there's no model where this plan has worked. Look at Greece today. Mm-hmm. That's that's the poster boy for the IMF's plan for bailing out the EU and IMF plan to bail out. So it hasn't worked anywhere, and it's not working in Ukraine. Yeah. And we, we shouldn't forget, of course, that Ukraine is, you know, it's it's attached to, to Russia. It has been a part of Russian culture and Russian uh, the Russian economy for a long, long time. So there's natural benefits uh, to a relationship, a close relationship with Russia and the Ukraine, where as the Western interests uh, might not be so closely aligned naturally uh, because of the uh, geographical aspects, I would think. And the U.S. recognizes that exact thing. That's the reason we had we had such things as NAFTA. The U.S. recognizes the importance of trading more more intensely with with your neighbors. So it's mm-hmm. something that the U.S. understands, uh, but it doesn't allow in places like Ukraine. And I think the reason is very simple: the U.S. has always intended to implement the Wolfowitz Plan, which is to this was a plan drawn up in the 90s by Paul Wolfowitz to make sure the U.S. is the sole superpower and that no other power can rise to the to the to the level of of threatening the u.s you know the, mm-hmm. the u.s must be the hegemon mm-hmm. and i think if you look at the the uh, behavior of of the u.s government since the 90s encircling russia with bases uh threatening russia uh you can see that this is the plan this is what they have in mind and it's by no means a defense of russia uh to to, to point out the simple fact all you have to do is go look at a map and look at nato bases and and how they've evolved since the end of the Cold War, you know. So <clears throat> there's clearly a plan to it. Yeah, well, it's, it is a plan to it, all right. But it seems to to be opposite the plan of our Constitution, the idea of of, of what America and what we are supposed to be about as people. But you know, that's another issue. But I, I suppose it's very possible. I mean, if you look at any country that really runs, you know, becomes extremely powerful, uh, it, it becomes. Um, a hubris sets in and people start believing things that maybe seems to be in their best interest in the short run and, and they don't see it from the other perspective. I think that's really likely what happens but um, uh, to any empire. But uh, one person that I found very interesting that you talked about on your website is Max Boot. Uh, he really wants to kick Russia where it hurts. Uh, I mean, there's such an aggressive view uh, of Russia. But, you know, it, just listening to what you had to say a minute ago about how the U.S. doesn't want anyone else to have any authority globally, uh, and we want to be the complete hegemon. Well, it, it seems to me that we're getting some blowback now from Russia and China as far as that goes. But this guy, Max Boot, uh, really wants us to go just, I think it looks like he wants to have a war with Russia. 
Well, certainly what he recommended, and this was in an article that he wrote for Commentary Magazine, which is a kind of a flagship of the neocons, what he, what he, what he prescribes is for the U.S. to arm Ukraine with anything they want and train Ukraine. Uh, of course, the, the, the president has already announced that he's sending U.S. military into Ukraine to start training the Ukrainian military. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess he wants it faster and harder, uh, this, this thing to take place. But, you know, the danger of, of, of this kind of idea is that you'll have U.S. troops in military outfits potentially uh, coming into contact uh, with Russian soldiers. Now, whether mm -hmm. they're and we, we all know that there are irregulars who have who have uh, volunteered to go into Ukraine from Russia uh, to to uh, to fight. You know, the U.S. claims that the Russian army as such is in Ukraine, but they've not provided any uh, any evidence of that. Um, and even actually, I was reading last week, uh, the um, the highest ranking military officer of Ukraine said that there are no there are no um, official Russian uh, army in, in Ukraine. It's simply it's volunteers. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> You have the potential of, of them coming head to head uh, in a live fire situation, and that's very very dangerous. I think, be, be they p perhaps on the B Russian border if they're border guards, because there is a lot of cross border action, or if there are Russian troops in there, U.S. troops shooting at Russian troops and vice versa is really the way that you uh, throw a match on a gasoline can. Yeah. You know? Well, there's. It seems as though there's no place. There's no place in the world that the neocons don't want us to to be more aggressive. I mean, you know, whether it's uh, Boko Haram or if it's uh, uh, Libya, or Syria, Iraq, a you know, wherever, Asia, China, wherever, we have, to, we have to go harder at these people. Well, it's also very profitable. It's also very profitable for these, these sort of the foreign policy class, whatever you want to call them in Washington. They, they all reside in very well-funded think tanks or they write for magazines that are heavily subsidized they don't have to live off of their subscriptions or advertising. Uh, they do very well, and uh, they're often in and out of administrations. Uh, so they have power, they have money, and they essentially bamboozle the American public because the media is so complicit in, uh, in this snow job, I would call it, because they're calling something that's very unpatriotic patriotism. It's unpatriotic to destroy our economy to pursue this, this bizarre fantasy of a world empire mm -hmm. you know that's that's the opposite of patriotism to do something that destroys your country that destroys the middle class well that's what's that's what seems to be going on and and what really bothers me as much as anything daniel is uh it, it seems to be a policy of insanity it's uh you know it was einstein i guess first that came up with the idea that uh if you continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results uh he defined that as insanity well I know very well as one who, who looks at the financial markets, the 1930s, the Federal Reserve threw all kinds of money and pumped money into the system uh, and tried to overcome the, uh, the deflationary spiral that was taking place, the business cycle uh, that was actually taking place. And after they had pumped up huge amounts of money that caused the problem to start with, but, you know, they never, they never um, the Federal Reserve and the Keynesians never really questioned the the policies of the 1930s, they said, well, we just didn't execute them well enough. We didn't throw enough money at the into the economy fast enough. Uh, and so this time Bernanke promised that he was going to do it, and he did it. And we've had, you know, trillions of dollars that were created out of nothing thrown into the economy, and yet our economy continues to get worse. I'm, t I'm mentioning this, Daniel, because it reminds me of something I saw that your boss, Ron Paul, wrote uh, on, the, on the website. He said, uh, if only... The neocons lament is only if we had done this, if only we had been more aggressive, if only we had gone in and killed more people and taken over more countries and changed the leadership in more nations, then we wouldn't have the problems that we have now. Yeah, it's, it's, their, it's their cheap way of getting out of the disasters they've caused. And they're doing the same thing with Syria now. It's, it's, it's very evident in Syria that there is not popular support for overthrowing the Assad government. They've had elections and... He's also, you know, been able to gain ground consistently. So the neocons, uh, although they have they've supported arming these radicals and, and, and people who uh, at least maybe sold themselves as moderates. And then as soon as they got U.S. weapons, ran over and joined ISIS, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they sold they sold this policy, which has made things worse, not only for the average Syrian, which is definitely the case, 
but made things worse for U.S. position in Syria, in, in the Middle East, made things worse for the U.S. reputation in the area. Uh, they've done everything they've done, they've made it worse. And so what do they do when they're caught? It's like a child. They're caught, you know, in this, in this horrible mistake. And they say, well, if only, if only you would let us do more earlier, you know, this thing wouldn't have happened. Right. And this is the case everywhere. And it's, um, even when it's not blatantly untrue, which we're seeing in places like Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, where, where U.S. intervention has made things worse, objectively worse. But even when it's, it's, even when it's not true in, in, in a direct form, it's also true, as you say, Jay, and you know uh, better than I in the financial circles, of, of the opportunity costs. Yeah. You know, what if you had, what if you had done something different? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's never, that's never considered by these people. Yeah. No, they, uh, they there's this uh, tremendous amount of hubris that we have the answers. We know the truth. You don't, we are the elite and we have uh, received our PhDs from Harvard, Princeton, Yale, uh, and the prestigious universities. We are the, the people that you should be looking up to. Just, just never mind. Listen to us. Follow what we tell you. And they never do any self-examination. They never go back to the basic premise of whether or not, uh, you know, pumping more money in the economy was the right thing to do to start with. No, no. Well, we just know it was. Uh, sending our bombers over and our drones and taking over more nations and fermenting uh, overthrow of governments that we don't like and won't cooperate with us economically, we'll never, they'll never examine whether or not, you know, the, the basic premise of doing that was right or not. Oh, of course it was right. So we just have, we have to do more of it. The only reason we're having a problem, it sort of reminds me is when I was a young fella, I had three younger brothers. And I remember when we would get in little, little fights, uh, I would always try to blame my brother uh, it was always it was always Roger's fault, you know, and it reminds me. And, and, and my father used to say, well, you know, you guys are just like nations. Nations do the same sort of thing. And as I look at how we're trying to blame Putin for our problems uh, or whoever, you know, instead of, uh, of course, I guess this comes with, uh, you know, with, when nations try to become empires. And we weren't supposed to be an empire. We we're supposed to be a, a republic. But that's another issue. Anything Absolutely. else, Daniel, you'd like to share with our listeners this week? Well, I'm really interested in what's happened in Greece this past week. You know, a, a, a radical party was uh, was successful in the election. They're they're in coalition with a, uh, I mean, not these terms don't have much meaning, but it's, a, it's supposedly a left party, far left, in coalition with the far right party. But the the left party, um, uh, Syriza, uh, ran uh, with the promise that they would uh, renegotiate the loans. They would um, uh, the loans with the IMF, the bailout loans that are crippling. Uh, the country that they would um, seek to have some of those loans or all of those loans forgiven mm -hmm. and it's really causing an earthquake in Europe right now uh, so on the financial side uh, the Germans particularly are having a heart attack about about this mm -hmm. uh, but on the other side uh, Greece now the new Greek government has said it will not automatically go along with new sanctions on Russia right uh, so that's a huge thing because the EU demands or requires unanimity in these foreign policy decisions, so it could be an earthquake. I'm not. I'm not thoroughly. Maybe I'm just a, a skeptic. I'm not thoroughly convinced they're everything that they're advertised. But if they're half of what they are advertised, then I think that uh, we're in for some very interesting changes in European politics in the near future. Yeah, and it could have some real repercussions on overall global politics. I would think if the Europeans refuse to go along with the. Uh, uh, the wishes of the uh, ruling elite in America that would have, you know, that would just try to dominate with NATO, uh, dominate the world uh, global scene. I mean, certainly we're seeing kickback from Russia and China right now with regard to uh, to all of that. So, yeah, I think that's really interesting, Daniel. And, you know, I saw Lawrence Summers on Charlie Rose last night commenting on, on Greece, and he was naming about 10 or 12 different demands uh, that Summers thought were pretty outrageous. Uh, that the Greek, that the new Greek government was asking for, and you know, Summers was saying, well, maybe the rollback on the debt that might make some sense, but the other things, you know, like the sanctions with respect to Russia, of course, that was off the table. So it's going to be really interesting to watch how this plays out. Uh, yeah. very, very interesting, Daniel. So we'll be looking to talk to you about that and many other issues. I'd just like to tell my listeners that uh, the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity has so many interesting articles. One I want to look uh, and read after Daniel and I finish talking here is one called China Looks West. What is at stake in Beijing's new Silk Road project? 
Uh, another one, uh, Surrendering Liberty, America's Fatal Freedom Apathy. These are all writers that, are, uh, that provide uh, content at the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Uh, a lot of great food for thought there, so I would really uh, suggest to our listeners that you go to the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity and then contribute a little bit if you uh, can find your way to do that to help uh, the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity uh, continue on. Uh, in its fight for the quest of uh, to to let people know what what is true, as as opposed to uh, the propaganda that we are being uh, hit with every day. Thank you so much for being with me again, Daniel. Look forward to doing it again next week. Thank you, Jay. 